So as a decade, do you think the 1940s was any good for horror films? I think most people's answer would be, I don't know, or just no, since it's overall a very overlooked period for the horror genre. This is likely because it's sandwiched between two decades that were landmark for the genre and very obviously distinct. The 1930s for edgy pre-code horror and the birth of the universal monsters, and the 1950s for the atomic sci-fi boom and the birth of Hammer Gothic. But in between, what the heck happened in the 1940s? So in this video, I'm gonna tell you about why the 1940s might be better than you think and as several pivotal moments for the horror genre by telling you my top 20 horror films of the 1940s. This is part of a series I'm doing. I recently covered the 1930s with my top 20 list. Now it's time for the 40s. My name is Daniel with the Cobwebs Channel, and let's get started. So we're kicking off at number 20 with Dead of Night from 1945. This is a British horror anthology film. Everybody loves horror anthology films, right? Creepshow, Tales from the Dark Side, stuff like that. This is a very early version. The story is about a man coming to a house to meet a bunch of people and realizes he's seen them all before in his dream. There they tell him about several strange moments that they they've had in their lives as we watch them all play out in different spooky stories. Now this is a huge classic for the horror anthology genre, but if you go into this movie thinking, oh cool, I'm gonna watch a bunch of spooky black and white short horror stories, the movie might actually disappoint you because the reality of the movie is just not that. We've got a story about a man who narrowly escapes death by a slight premonition. We've got a story about a young woman who maybe sees a ghost, though she's not sure it happens when it happens. Another story about a couple of golfers who are fighting over one woman. That one's actually mostly comedic, a little bit of a ghostly element, but mostly just a comedy segment. Most of the segments just don't have much horror content, but the reason people still talk about this movie to this day is the final segment, which is awesome and the reason this is making the list. It's about a ventriloquist who comes to believe that his dummy is actually alive and controlling him. This is a very early version of the spooky doll genre, and ventriloquist dummies have come to be icons of horror because of Slappy from Goosebumps or James Wan's movie Dead Silence. This actually might be the birth of the spooky ventriloquist dummy. I can't think of an earlier example and it's awesome. At number 19, The Invisible Man Returns from 1940. So this movie is about a man who's sentenced to death for killing his brother, a crime he did not actually commit. And in order to escape this fate, he goes to Dr. Frank Griffin, who's the brother of Jack Griffin, the original Invisible Man played by Claude Rains, to get the invisibility drug so he can escape his sentence. Then he goes out looking for the real murderer, but comes to find the invisibility drug drives you insane. By the way, I do want to show you my physical media copies of most of these movies, but a lot of them I just don't have good visual aids for. So this one I have in the Invisible Man collection, but that doesn't really show you anything about the Invisible Man Returns. Besides the fact that this is the first sequel to the classic Universal Monsters Invisible Man film, this movie is most notable for being one of the early examples of Vincent Price starring in a horror movie. Yes, the main character, the Invisible Man, is played by the iconic Vincent Price, though he wasn't really a horror icon by this point. He did a lot more noir and drama films at this time, wouldn't become a big horror icon until towards the late 1950s. But nevertheless, he is great in this movie, definitely not as good as Claude Rains. Claude Rains is the best Invisible Man of all time. But this is just a solid sequel, moves the story forward with a new character, but still has the connection of Jack Griffin's brother, and... I think it's a good time if you've only seen the original Invisible Man, like I think a lot of people have, the sequel is well worth your time. At number 18, Cat People from 1942. So this is a story of a Serbian immigrant in New York City who begins a romance with a handsome architect and the two are quickly married. However, the marriage quickly falls into difficulty due to Irene's belief that she is descended from a race of cat people and will turn into a murderous jungle cat if she gives into physical passion for her husband. Yes, this is a movie about the dangers of getting too horny. So overall, I would say 1940s horror belongs to two dudes, and one of them is Val Luton. Val Luton was a producer of a lot of horror films during the 1940s. Val Luton was actually a novelist of pulp books that was asked by RKO to head up the creation of a bunch of horror films. In his words, he was actually asked to make a bunch of movies with no money, no time, and terrible titles. That's basically what he got for these movies. He was given titles, asked to make a movie out of them. I would disagree about the terrible titles because I think there's some really good ones, including Cat People. And Cat People, it was the most classic of all those movies that he made. It's not my favorite. We've got some other Val Luton movies higher up on the list, 
But this is a darn good film. It is remarkable for a horror film this early to not have anything to do with gothic, castles, cobwebs, but just be a movie about normal people in a normal setting. This is ultimately a horror film about a marriage falling apart, about a marriage of two people who are very different, and how can they reconcile those differences and actually be happy together? And the movie just uses the metaphor of cat people in order to do it. Now, this is another movie that if you go into it expecting to see monsters, expecting to see horrific cat people like you would actually see in the 1980s remake of this film, this is going to disappoint you because like a lot of Val Luton movies, this movie is all about dread and suggestion. And I think that would be disappointing if the movie wasn't actually creepy. And it is. It's got a very creepy atmosphere and one of the early examples of a great jump scare. I don't completely love the movie. I think mostly because of the leading man, Kent Smith. He just doesn't have chemistry with anyone, and he, the movie really hinges on his chemistry between two different women in this movie, and he just doesn't sell it. But outside of him, this is a good early horror film that I highly recommend. At number 17, Weird Woman from 1944. So this movie is about a professor who brings his new wife to America after she's been raised on a remote island. After that point, the professor gets more and more successful in his professional life, has a wonderful marriage with this woman, but then comes to find out that she has kept her witchcraft and voodoo rituals from that island into their modern life. After he makes her give that up, everything in his life starts falling apart, and he's not sure if this witchcraft stuff was actually true. So this movie is my favorite of the Inner Sanctum Mysteries. This is a series of horror films all starring Lon Chaney Jr. Lon Chaney Jr. is the other dude that 1940s horror belongs to. Val Luton and Lon Chaney Jr. They ruled the pack. And if the premise of this movie sounded familiar, it may be because it's based on a book called The Conjure Wife that was also the inspiration for the classic 1960s horror film Burn Witch Burn. Now, Weird Woman is not as good as Burn Witch Burn. It also has a way less cool title, but it's still a classic story that I really enjoy. Lon Chaney Jr. is great in it. Evelyn Ankers is great in it as kind of a rival witch. It's just a good 1940s witchy horror movie. At number 16, Arsenic and Old Lace from 1944. This movie stars Cary Grant as a writer who suddenly falls in love, gets married, and heads home to introduce her to his two maiden aunts who raised him. And there he finds out about about his aunt's hobby, which is killing lonely old men and burying them in the cellar. Now, there's a lot of horror movies in the 40s that are very much genre benders and kind of fit here and there, and this is one of those movies. I admit, this is more of a screwball comedy than it is a horror film. However, it's got more than enough very macabre horror elements to get it onto this list, like murder and Cary Grant's criminal brother who shows up, who is a Boris Karloff lookalike, which is actually a pretty great gag throughout the movie, and his henchman is even played by Peter Lorre. Come on, you can't have a classic horror list without a little Peter Lorre on there. The movie is so funny, an absolutely hilarious comedy. Cary Grant is phenomenal, one of his funniest performances he ever gave, and the movie takes place on Halloween night and has some great autumnal atmosphere that you would just love for October. Number 15, The Scarlet Claw from 1944. When a woman in a remote Canadian village is found dead with her throat torn out, the local villagers blame the legendary monster of La Marte Rouge, who they believe roams the marshes around the village. But Sherlock Holmes, who gets drawn into the case, suspects a human murderer. So this is one of Universal's Sherlock Holmes films starring Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. They made a ton of these movies in the 40s. And most of them are thrillers, mysteries, and I wouldn't put them on a horror list. But this one feels like the Universal Monsters Sherlock Holmes film. The atmosphere is exact with Universal Monsters. The forest that they go out into to find this monster or possibly just a murderer. The movie keeps you guessing which way it's going to go. Feels so much like The Wolfman. The movie even has part of The Wolfman's score in it, which Universal did with a lot of their horror films during this time. And it's just very, very spooky. You do actually get to see some kind of monster, but again, you're not really sure what it is. And Basil Rathbone is my favorite Sherlock Holmes. I love this series of movies. I actually did a whole video on the entire series, and Scarlet Claw is one of the best of the bunch. At number 14, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman from 1943. When some grave robbers open the grave of Larry Talbot, the Wolfman, and awaken him, he doesn't like the idea of being immortal and killing people when the moon is full, so he tries to find a descendant of Dr. Frankenstein in the hopes that the doctor can cure him. But along the way, he finds that the Frankenstein's monster is still alive. This is just a classic Universal Monsters monster mashup movie. 
actually the first of their monster mashup movies. This movie actually works very well as a sequel to The Wolfman, first and foremost. It's just kind of icing on the cake that we also get a Frankenstein story in here as well. The Frankenstein monster in this one is played by Bella Lugosi, and I admit he's not great in the role, which is actually kind of funny because he was originally going to be Frankenstein in the original Frankenstein, and that plan just kind of fell through. But it's still so much fun to watch The Wolfman and Frankenstein on screen together, and they have a climactic fight that's just such a blast. Number 13, The Mummy's Hand from 1940. So in this movie, a couple of young, out-of-work archaeologists in Egypt discover evidence of the burial place of the ancient Egyptian princess Ananka. And after receiving funding from an eccentric magician and his beautiful daughter, they set out into the desert only to be terrorized by a sinister high priest and the living mummy Karis, who is the guardian of Ananka's tomb. When I first checked this movie out years ago, I was surprised to find that the classic hammer horror version of The Mummy, simply titled The Mummy, is really a remake of The Mummy's Hand, not of the original Universal Monsters The Mummy. This is the first sequel to that original Mummy film, and it's exactly what you would think of as a Mummy movie, while the original Mummy is not. Well, I've just said the word Mummy so many times. And the reason for that is because this is a film in which a bandaged up, monstrous mummy stumbles around and kills people, which is what everybody thinks of as a Mummy movie. And that original movie with Boris Karloff is just not that. It's really much more of a gothic romance. I love this film for a long time. I actually considered it my favorite Mummy movie. I have since calmed down on that. I don't think that anymore, but it's still such a blast. I really enjoy the two lead characters who are a little bit of a proto Abbott and Costello, although definitely less goofy. The straight man of the two has a romance in the movie that I just love and I think is really sweet. And The Mummy is played by Tom Tyler. And this is the only film in which he would play The Mummy. Lon Chaney Jr. takes over after this film. And he's great. And one of the reasons for that is they have a great effect where they blacken out his eyes and it's very creepy. At number 12, Flesh and Fantasy from 1943. So this is another horror anthology film, but it actually came out two years before Dead of Night. So you can't give all the credit to Dead of Night. Flesh and Fantasy deserves a lot. The movie starts out with a couple of old men and one of them says he had a very creepy dream and he's not sure what it means. And the other one tells him a series of stories that he thinks might be able to help him. The first story is about a woman who's very uncomfortable about her appearance, but she puts on the mask of a beautiful woman and goes out into a Mardi Gras festival to try to make the man she loves fall in love with her. This segment is fantastic and kind of creepy because the mask doesn't just turn her into a beautiful woman. It stays a mask the whole time. It's got a very creepy, uncanny valley kind of a feel to it. The next one is about Edward G. Robinson, who is told by a fortune teller that he's going to kill someone. And there he is tormented by this fact until he starts starts to get very attracted to the idea. Finally, we got a story starring Charles Boyer about a tightrope walker who has a dream that he falls. He meets Barbara Stanwyck, falls in love with her, but this also leads him to believe even more he's gonna fall off that type room. This movie I discovered because of this Vinegar Syndrome Blu-ray release that I picked up and absolutely fell in love with. The movie has an incredible cast of, yes, Edward G. Robinson, Barbara Stanwyck, Charles Boyer, Robert Cummings, Betty Field. It's just got so many people in it. And it's directed by a French director, which I think really shows in a good way because it just looks more stylish and interesting than a lot of Hollywood films during this time period. It's got an atmosphere kind of in between horror and fairy tale and classic Hollywood and a bit of French experimentalism, and it's phenomenal. My favorite horror anthology of the 1940s. At number 11, I Married a Witch from 1942. So in New England in the 1600s, a Puritan witch hunter is cursed after burning a witch at the stake that his descendants will never find happiness in their marriages. We then cut to present day with one of his descendants, played by Frederick March, a politician who's running for state governor, who then meets an ancient witch, played by Veronica Lake. This is a fantastic, delightful, classic Hollywood romantic comedy with so many laughs and so much charm. Frederick March and Veronica Lake are great in this movie. Veronica Lake is adorable and so gorgeous, of course. So much fun as this very mischievous, very romantic witch. The movie definitely feels like a strong influence on the 60s TV show, Bewitched for sure. But the witchy elements are actually pretty great. Those flashbacks to the witch burnings are very spooky, atmospheric. There's just a lot of witchy content in here that's surprisingly satisfying for romantic comedy in the 40s. At number 10, The Body Snatcher from 1945. Based on the Robert Louis Stevenson story of the same name, this follows a doctor who's the head of a medical school who needs 
dead bodies for his students to practice on. And in order to avoid the laws, get all the dead bodies he needs, he contracts the services of Mr. Gray, who is played by Boris Karloff, a former medical student convicted of grave robbery. We're finally back around to Val Luton's films, and this is one of the few that's actually on Blu-ray. All the rest I have in this DVD box set, but I'm really happy to have The Body Snatcher on Blu-ray because it's definitely one of the best. When you ask what is the best performance by Boris Karloff, it's, it's impossible not to say Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, but right after that, I would have to go with The Body Snatcher. His performance is so creepy in this movie about a man who's really living his entire life out of spite against this doctor who he has a very dark past with. Now he goes out, kills people, grave robs, digs up bodies, delivers them. It's very much a Burke and Hare kind of story. The movie actually references Burke and Hare many times. Overall, it's just a very dark, dark drama with incredible atmosphere, like scenes in graveyards with wind blowing, leaves going in the wind, that is just phenomenal, spooky time vibes, but gets extremely dark and macabre by the end in a way that's very satisfying. Also shout out Bela Lugosi, he's got a small role in this movie. At number nine, The Spiral Staircase from 1946. So this is a thriller that involves a serial killer who is going around and murdering disabled women. In. Our lead character is a mute servant girl in a rich household who is terrified that she is going to be next. Yes, you could definitely classify this more as a thriller, but the reason it definitely gives me a lot of horror vibes is because the movie really feels like a prototype for a giallo. Giallo is a bunch of murder mystery horror films that came out in Italy in the 60s, 70s, and 80s predominantly. And The Spiral Staircase just feels like an early classic Hollywood version of that. This serial killer plot is really sick and mean-spirited, just going around killing any women with disabilities. And I really love our lead character played by Dorothy McGuire. She never speaks in the movie, of course, but still remains a very compelling character from start to finish. The movie is very stylish. We have P.O kill scenes. It has that kind of typical thing where people turn around and are like, oh, it's you. But of course, we don't know who it is. The most we actually see of the killer until the end are very close-ups on his eyes. The movie's got a great cast, a lot of very memorable, interesting characters with a lot of interesting relationships going on. It's just a really interesting drama, intense thriller, and an early version of a giallo horror film. At number eight, House of Frankenstein from 1944. This is another example of a Universal Monsters monster mashup movie about a deranged scientist who escapes from prison and takes over for the director of a traveling chamber of horrors so he can revive the infamous Count Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, and the Wolfman. Yeah, I have this movie on VHS, which I think is pretty cool. This is the first movie that unites those three classic characters, Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman. And it's so good. It's so successful at it. Overall, what the movie is, is it kind of combines three different classic Universal Monsters movies and does shorter, you know, less good versions of them, but is so entertaining and so much fun because it's just so packed with all that goodness. Now, the movie actually stars Boris Karloff, not as the Frankenstein monster, but as the deranged scientist, which I don't mind at all because Boris Karloff is awesome in this movie. He's such a great lead. And I would say the co-lead is Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman, who's a great character in this. The movie progresses his story very well of really just wanting to die. That becomes his arc throughout all of his movies. He just wants to die, but he's an immortal werewolf, so he just can't. It's the first time Glenn Strange would play the Frankenstein monster, and he's my second favorite actor to play the monster in a Universal Monsters movie. And we've got John Carradine as Count Dracula, and he is not a good Dracula. I don't care for him. And the Dracula part of this movie is so tacked on and pretty unrelated to everything else, but I don't mind. It's pretty fun, entertaining little vampire sidetrack until we get back to the real movie. At number seven, Son of Dracula from 1943. Count Dracula is invited to the United States under the name Count Count Alucard by a young woman, but her boyfriend and the local officials are very suspicious of this newcomer who is interested in the virile soil and the young blood of the new world. Of the Universal Monster sequels for Dracula, this one is my favorite. I think it is one of the most underrated Universal Monsters movies ever. It's so good. But I think the reason a lot of people overlook it is because Lon Chaney Jr., yes, he's back on the list, plays Dracula. And he's not a great Dracula. Let's just rip that band-aid off right away. Lon Chaney Jr. is like as American seeming as John Wayne, and he just does not work for a Carpathian vampire count. 
but he's fine enough. He doesn't detract from the movie too much, especially when everything else in the movie is so good. This is a rare Universal Monsters movie where the protagonists, the human characters, are the most interesting part. They're fantastic. I love this young woman who gets drawn under Dracula's spell, a very creepy macabre woman who feels like she's just genuinely into the whole idea of being a vampire. And I really like the story of her sister and her boyfriend as they're trying to save her. All the human stuff is unusually good in this movie. And the atmosphere of New Orleans, a very Southern Gothic kind of feel is awesome. At number six, I Walked With a Zombie from 1943. This movie is about a young nurse who is contracted to go to a Caribbean island to care for the wife of a rich man who is catatonic and possibly dead. This is my favorite of all of the Val Luton horror films. I think it's awesome. It's a very early example of a zombie movie. And if you see the title and you don't know the history of the zombie genre, this movie is going to very much surprise you because zombie movies were not like modern zombie movies until George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. And this is back in the time when zombies were synonymous with voodoo. That's the origins of the whole zombie legend. And that's what we get in this movie. No traditionally modern zombie stuff of any kind, but a lot of fairly creepy voodoo stuff involving one male zombie that's actually a very creepy presence in the film. But I do primarily love this movie as a romantic drama. I think it's fantastic in that way. Frances D plays our lead. She's so beautiful and charming. I love her in this movie. And she falls in love with the rich man whose wife she is caring for, played by Tom Conway. Tom Conway Conway is actually in a lot of the Val Luton films. He was also in Cat People that we talked about earlier. And I love him in all of the films, but this one most primarily. And the romance that blooms between them is very subtle, very understated, but I think incredibly romantic. The movie is very successful as a romantic drama between two people who can't really be together. The fact that it is a spooky zombie horror movie is really just icing on the cake for me. Cracking into the top five, it's Shadow of a Doubt from 1943. A classic Alfred Hitchcock film about a bored teenager who lives in small town suburbia who is excited when her uncle, who she absolutely loves, is coming to visit them, played by Joseph Cotton, but then starts to suspect, could her uncle be a serial killer who they know is on the loose? Now, I would say most of Alfred Hitchcock's movies are straight up thrillers. I would classify very few of them as horror films, but this is one I would. I think this is a frightening serial killer horror film. Now, the movie lets you know right at the top that Joseph Cotton is a serial killer. There's no mystery to that at all. And he's incredibly creepy. I think the most unrealistic thing about the film is that his family, his niece, his sister, you know, all the family that he comes to stay with are so accepting of him and they all just love him so much. I mean, I get he's family, but the dude is obviously a creep. And as his niece starts learning more and more about him and becomes more and more suspecting of him, the movie gets very scary, especially as he realizes that she is onto him. There's a scene where she opens up the newspaper and finds out about all the murders that are happening that's genuinely frightening. And the last time I watched this movie, I realized how influential I think this film was on John Carpenter's Halloween. Now, Hitchcock as a whole was the biggest influence on Halloween, Psycho most particularly, but I think Shadow of the Doubt too, a chilling film about a practically inhuman killer coming into small town America and wrecking havoc. At number four, The Uninvited from 1944. This is about a brother and a sister who move into an old seaside house that's been abandoned for many years on the coast, only to soon discover it is haunted by the ghost of the mother of their neighbor's granddaughter, with whom the brother has fallen in love. The Uninvited is one of the landmark moments of 1940s horror, because this is a turning point in the haunted house genre. Prior to The Uninvited, most every haunted house film you would see, turns out the ghosts aren't really real. It's basically a Scooby-Doo kind of plot where they discover there's some criminals behind it to try to get some money or something like that. But The Uninvited is an extremely early example of a movie that takes a hard stance, no ghosts are real. This is a haunted house movie through and through. And honestly, it's one of my very favorites in the entire genre. This is another movie that I think is very successful as a drama, as a romance film. I love Ray Milland and Gail Russell in this movie so much. Their romance is so genuinely cute. And yeah, I am a romance movie fan. And I think this is really successful at that. Has phenomenal coastal mansion, small town kind of atmosphere, almost like a slightly more gothic Stephen King kind of a thing, which I really love. But the ghost stuff 
It delivers. It's good. There's a good seance scene. You do see a ghostly apparition towards the end of the film. And there's a whole mystery around the ghost too. Not whether the ghost is real, but who is the ghost and what are their intentions? That's very intriguing. Number three might surprise you. It's the adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad from 1943. This is a classic Disney animated film that really just slaps two different stories together. It's about an hour long. Each story is about a half an hour. The first one is based on the wind in the willows about Mr. Toad's wild ride. And the second one is based on Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Yes, only half of this story is horror, but I just decided throw that first half out. I mean, you can watch it. It's fun enough, but I decided to not to consider it. I decided to rank this movie based on its second story, The Adventures of Sleepy Hollow, and it's number three for me. It's one of my favorite things ever made. Now, I'm a huge fan of the original Sleepy Hollow story by Washington Irving. I love a lot of different adaptations of it, but this is my favorite adaptation of that classic story. Some people might be surprised to find out that most of the movie is about a love triangle and we don't get into the Headless Horseman until the very end, but that's how the original story is, and I love that story. Also a Disney musical. It's got three songs. All of them are phenomenal. Some of the best music that ever came out of Disney. And when we do get to the midnight ride between Ichabod and the Headless Horseman. It's some of the greatest horror of all time. I love the Headless Horseman. This is the best version of him you're ever going to get. At number two, my favorite horror comedy of all time, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein from 1948. A comedy version of a classic Universal Monsters mashup movie in which Abbott and Costello play a couple of freight handlers who discover that they are moving the bodies of Dracula and Frankenstein's monster. When they get revived, Larry Talbot, aka the Wolfman, comes into town to try to help stop them. Yeah, despite the fact that this is a comedy, this is the second best Universal monsters film of the 40s. Now, the classic comedy duo, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, actually did not want to make this movie. They thought it was going to be crap. And the director said, uh, all the guys who played the monsters were delightful. The real monsters were Abbott and Costello, which is kind of a sad thing about the behind the scenes. But joke's on you, Abbott and Costello, because I've seen a lot of your movies. I haven't seen any that are half as good as this. It makes the brilliant decision to keep the Universal Monsters characters intact, not try to make them silly, goofy, or funny at all, and just drop a couple of funny guys in there to add all the comedy. I've seen a lot of horror comedies where the goofiest thing is the monster and all the characters are normal. And I just don't think that works as well. And I'm so glad to get Lon Chaney Jr. back as Larry Talbot. Always phenomenal, definitely is here. But at number one with a silver bullet, it's The Wolfman from 1941. The classic story of Larry Talbot who comes back home to his small town, falls for a girl, takes her to go see a fortune teller on a date and ends up getting bitten by a werewolf. It's almost hard for me to describe how much I love this movie. It is my favorite Universal Monsters movie, not just of the 40s, but ever. It's easily in my top five horror movies ever made. The Wolfman is perfect. I think one thing that holds some Universal Monsters films back is they have a great monster, but not so great human characters, protagonists. And this movie, we get the monster as the protagonist and as the monster, which is the perfect formula. This is not the first werewolf movie, but it is undoubtedly the movie that sets the template for what a werewolf movie is going to be. And that has never wavered. It has never been replaced as the werewolf movie that everything else is jumping off of. I love Lon Chaney Jr. in this so much. He's so lovable. He's so sympathetic. We want him to be okay so bad. I love his relationship with Evelyn Anchors, one of my favorite horror romances of all time. And when we get to the werewolf, look, this is my favorite werewolf. My favorite werewolf design always has been ever since I was a kid. And the scenes of him stalking through a foggy forest at night looking for the kill, man, that is just the best horror you're ever going to see. That's my top 20 of the 1940s, but please let me know down in the comments below what are your favorite horror films of the 40s and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss my top 20 of the 50s. But if you missed it, my top 20 of the 30s is right over here. You can click on that or this playlist down here for a lot of my different rankings, a lot of spooky topics there. Thank you so much for watching. With all that said, don't forget to enjoy your today. Take some time to have some fun and I will see you next time.